Welcome to the uh, final public affairs uh, luncheon for 2012, uh, Minnesota Year End Report, Innovation and Improvement in Government Performance. My name is Doug Hennis. I'm Vice President for University and Government Relations at St. Thomas, and I'm also a member of the St. Paul Chamber Board. St. Thomas is proud to sponsor this series um, of luncheons, which are held throughout the year because we believe they're vital uh, for the business community to stay informed and engaged in key policy issues that affect all of us. As this year draws to a close, we thought it would be the, a good time for a year-end update from our state and legislative auditors. Uh, they track state and government, uh, state and local government accountability, and they'll share with us some of the metrics that they use to gauge effectiveness and efficiency so we can see what's working well and where efforts at government reform should be focused. Before we get started, however, I'd like to take a minute to thank all our sponsors that make uh, this event and other great chamber events possible. Uh, along with St. Thomas, the co-presenting sponsor for the Public Affairs Series is Goff Public. And I'm not sure if we have a Goff. Oh, there's Elizabeth. Uh, so thanks for joining us. The corporate sponsors are Target, Platinum Bank, Grand Casino Malax Hinkley, and Job Corps. And the contributing sponsors are Security and Financial Group and the OWL Bookkeeping and CFO Services. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce our presenters. First is Rebecca Otto. She was uh, elected Minnesota's 18th State Auditor in 2006 and was re-elected two years ago after receiving the endorsement of the three previous state auditors from both major political parties. Prior to Rebecca's election to statewide office, she had many years of public service, having taught public school, served on a school board, and in the legislature. She also has experience in the business world, having run a successful 50-employee business before turning her focus to public service. Our second presenter today also has a history, long history of public service, starting out in 1971 as a researcher for the Minnesota House of Representatives, Jim Nobles worked his way up to Deputy Legislative Auditor before being appointed to serve a six-year term as Legislative Auditor for the state in 1983. He's been reappointed five consecutive terms since then. Please give them a warm welcome. <laughs> um, Auditor Otto is going to start with some opening remarks, followed by Auditor Nobles, and then we'll open the floor to uh, Q&A. Thank you. Okay, there's a lot of info here. I'm gonna to try to give you enough content to maybe spur some interesting questions. Um, half my job is serving on six state boards, one of those being State Board of Investment where we invest about 50 to $60 billion a year, as well as a large pension fund, um, rural finance authority, housing finance agency, we're like the sixth largest bank in the state, um, and so on. So <laughs> I have many responsibilities. A staff of about 115 and a budget of about nine million, depending on the year per year. We oversee $20 billion per year spent by our local governments. Now, the way we pr provide this oversight, we don't do a financial and compliance audit of the 3,300 units of local government that report to us. <laughs> we do it on some entities, we, but we do it through auditing, we do it through reviewing, reporting, educating, and investigating. All right? That's my elevator speech. Now. Um, Part of the way our oversight system works in Minnesota for our local governments is that when private CPA firms are auditing local governments, the ones that we don't do, and there's many of them, if they run into a, someone who's misused public funds or they have evidence of fraud, they are required by law to report to our office. Now, as you know, we've gone through a downturn for some time. We're coming out of it. Um, but going back to 2007, there were zero, what we call 6.67 reports. That's the section of statute this requirement is in. And it started increasing over the years. 2010 was a high of eight. Um, 2012 um, started settling down. But in an economic downturn, you tend to have an increase in misuse of funds. And it's not just government. It's private sector. When you're having to cut more and more positions and you have less uh, segregation of duties in your, uh, with your financial staff, there can be issues. And people have financial pressures in their lives as well. Now we have another kind of report that we receive. So our system doesn't just rely on our staff finding stuff. It relies on the private firms to report to us. It also relies on all local government officials, whether you're elected or you're an employee, to report to our office if you have evidence of misuse of funds or fraud. 
And so in a downturn, going back to 2007, we had 34 of those. It went up 64, 54, 2010 was 68, 2011 was 73. So as you can see, um, we were getting an increased number of reports. And as of um, September of 2012, we had 63. Do these all pan out to be fraud? Nope. But the good news is, is we do get reports when people suspect there may be an issue. So that's the good news. We have a good system in Minnesota. Now, these 3,300 units of local government report annual financial information to us, okay? And they also, many of them are audited. And so my staff collects that information, we review it, and then we make it comparable, and then we report it. So I wanted to show you cities quickly just to give you a sense of what we do. Our office, in terms of evaluating government performance, um, one is reporting of theft or fraud, but another is um, looking at their revenues, expenditures, and debt over each year and over time. Um, so city revenues, these are all cities as a group, that blue top line is the actual, actual revenue. And as you can see, there, it went from 2003 to 7, it was an increase in actual dollars, and it really flattened off between 7 and 10. You had a little blip between 9 and 10, that was the federal stimulus funds that went to the cities to help them with projects. If you look at inflation-adjusted revenues for cities over that 10-year period of time, the, the 2010 level of revenues were below 2001, which paints an interesting story. Um, and, and then I, we can take these and further break them down by category. And so this is in um, inflation-adjusted dollars, just so you know, the revenues. The only two categories we saw consistent increases in over that 10-year period were taxes, and, you know, that were collected, and federal grants. And part of the federal grants, again, is the stimulus program. This one I just love. So, you know, you talk about sources of revenues for cities. This is something our office can do to help you understand government performance and what's going on. Um, the line going up is property taxes um, as a percent of total revenues. And the, the other line going down is intergovernmental revenues as a percent of total revenues. And so for our cities as a group, they're relying more and more on property taxes as a source of revenue. Intergovernmental revenues were dropping partial, partially because of a change the state made back in 2003, I think it was, legislative session. But you can see in 9 and 10, there was, again, a little increase, and that would be those the federal stimulus funds. Um, and finally, the expenditure line. This is really important for government uh, performance and kind of what's going on. Um, actual expenditures, you know, they were on an increase, but then they started bumping around in 6, and then the economic downturn, they kept bumping, so in actual dollars. <coughs> In inflation-adjusted expenditures, 2010 levels were below 2001, which to me is a pretty interesting thing to, to take a look at. And I wanted to show you in inflation-adjusted dollars, the category that went up through that 10-year period of time, you know, consistently was public safety. Well, one of the big things that our cities do is streets and highways and public safety, so it'd be understandable. And I think that 9-11 may play into that too, and that there were a lot of, there was new equipment that local governments had to buy in case we had another, you know, major incident with communication and, and things. So I um, thought that was interesting. We look at unreserved fund balances in terms of cash flow for cities. You all know about cash flow. And we want them to have about five months worth of revenue to cash flow in between revenue, um, chunks of revenue they get from the state. And they're in a safe zone. They're good. They're good as a group. Um, another thing, government performance. You have to look at the pressures that the cities might be facing. If we have any future state budget shortfalls, we know we're facing another one. That impacts some of them in terms of getting their aid cut from the state and local government aid. Um, the ARA cliff, that's the stimulus funds, they're gone. So the cities will have to deal with not having that. And then the whole um, market downturn had an impact on property taxes, people staying in their homes, forfeitures, and so you have a slightly eroding tax base. But luckily, home values are coming back up, but it does put pressure on cities, and, and it can have an impact on their performance. What have I seen in response to this, the, the difficult times? Sometimes you see good things. Cities have been um, trying to re reduce expenditures, trying to do more collaboration, cooperation, and I'm seeing more of sharing financial um, personnel which is interesting, and it's happening especially in greater Minnesota. They can't afford a full-time person, but they need a qualified person, so sometimes they're splitting somebody up, which is working out well. They're sharing resources. They've been doing that for a long time. Some entities report have been reporting late to us, but we did see improvement this year. 
when they don't report on time, if they have local government aid, they don't get it. Because it's really, it's a carrot. Um, and that's not a good thing to have happen in a downturn, typically. Um, how do we promote awareness about increased risk of fraud in an economic downturn, or just in general? Um, we educate the auditors who are out there doing the work. We educate local officials on how to avoid the problems that might occur in a downturn. We work to educate the public because they're our eyes and ears. And um, we do con <coughs> conduct investigations. And we have the City Audit Project, which is where we take all the audits we have not conducted on cities, review them, and look for trends. And we do send letters out to some cities who have either too many findings or they have a certain type of finding that would be dangerous in an, in an economic downturn when budgets are very tight. And that's been pretty effective. Um, improvement and innovation. A couple different things. This is to spark questions. Um, there was a local public pensions investment study group bill that um, my office ran, I chaired, and we pulled together all the local public pension plans along with State Board of Investment, reviewed their statutes. We had auditors in the room, brokers in the room, we had all kinds of folks, and they helped inform the process. We overhauled the statutes to make it easier for pension plans to be in compliance, easier for the auditors to audit the entities to make sure they're in compliance. Um, and so it was a really great project, and it past, and so it was one of those good news kind of things. Um, my office responded, there's some really tiny entities that get audited once every five years, and their revenues are fairly small. Privacy CPA firm said, you know, it'd be really great if we could do something short of a full-blown audit for these entities, because they don't even really understand what it means when they get it. So my office developed agreed-upon procedures for these really small entities, which is a better end product for the users um, to help them make sure they understand what they're doing well. And it also um, has reduced costs for them, which to me is a really important thing that we can do. And we ask the CPA firms to review it for us and give us feedback. So we work as a team with the private sector as well. There's another thing that James asked me to mention, the Council on Local Results and Innovation. I serve on that as well as the Collaborative Governance Council. Um, but this particular one developed a performance measurement for cities and, and actually counties. Um, Cities and counties can voluntarily participate in the program. If they do and we certify them saying they've met all the requirements, they get a little extra local government aid and they're exempt from levy limits. Um, there's a report on my website that shows the results. So they're, they're implementing performance measurements. It might be around how safe do you feel in the community or you know, road, um, the pavement condition rating, you know, whatever. You can have hard numbers and you can um, survey your community and then they report that out to the community, and they're measuring performance, so it's connecting people's tax dollars to what they're getting and creating a more constructive conversation with um, your government, which is, I think, really important. Hello, it's good to be with you. Again, I'm Jim Nobles, the Legislative Auditor. Let me first tell you a little bit about the Office of the Legislative Auditor. Uh, you've already heard one of the things that often comes up about the difference between the Legislative Auditor and the State Auditor. And I know the terms are very confusing, uh, that the state auditor does not audit the state, the legislature does not audit the legislature. So that's one handy tool for keeping track. Uh, this all occurred back in 1972, uh, when there was an organization that uh, Governor Wendell Anderson appointed of, of business executives who came in and studied state government. It was called the Loaned Executive Action Program, or LEAP. And they said that the legislative branch really ought to be the branch of government that has the tool of accountability and oversight of state government. And so they created the Office of the Legislative Auditor as a professional nonpartisan office, similar to the Congressional GAO, or Government Accountability Office. And they decided that the way to divide the jurisdiction uh, over auditing was to have the state auditor audit local government. Uh, and then the state auditor could also, as uh, Rebecca just indicated, serve as, a, as an officer within that branch of government without creating any sort of independence or conflict of interest issues. So the state auditor audits uh, local units of government. The legislative auditor has jurisdiction to audit state government. And we have really broad and deep jurisdiction throughout state government. We audit virtually everything uh, in the executive branch from the governor's office down to the board of uh, dentistry. Uh, we also have jurisdiction to audit within the judicial branch. But the one thing we don't audit in the uh, state government is the legislative branch. There is one significant difference, though, uh, which isn't in the law that I've noticed about the difference between 
the state auditor and the legislative auditor. And that is, state auditors tend to go on to greater glory. And so we'll be watching to see uh, Rebecca's path. But if you, <laughs> if you recall, uh, the current governor, uh, Mark Dayton, was previously uh, the state auditor as was Arnie Carlson. And so there is this pattern of, uh, <laughs> now you might have noticed though that it's quite different with the legislative auditor. And that is, I'm currently serving my fifth six year term as, you can do the math, that means I will soon have been legislative auditor for 30 years, my term will be up next year and I may even ask for another six year term. So I think the message there is, the state auditor goes on to greater glory there is no greater glory than being legislative on <laughs> Let me tell you a little more about uh, who we are and what we do. Uh, we do uh, have uh, a lot of financial audit work that we do. We audit the state's annual financial statements, gap-based financial statements. Uh, we go into various departments and agencies of state government and audit their controls and compliance. We also have a program evaluation division in the office. It's the smaller unit within the office of the legislative auditor, but it's one that really, I think, much more directly uh, serves the legislature and its information needs. So every year, uh, we go to all the legislators and we ask them, what are the concerns and issues that you have about the operation of state government or a program or a function and sometimes, frankly, um, that's a program or function that is carried out locally, uh, but they do want an evaluation. And we leave the financial auditing to Rebecca's office, but we might go in and evaluate, for example, special education, which is a program that is uh, funded by the state and the federal government, but administered by school districts. Or we may do an evaluation of, of county programs for human services, most all state human service programs are administered by counties. So there's sometimes a little bit of confusion about, again, the jurisdiction um, that the legislative auditor goes in and does these evaluations. And again, we do them because we go to legislators every year and we ask them, what are your concerns? What would be helpful to you in terms of an independent, nonpartisan, outside look? Uh, they get a lot of information from a lot of sources. And uh, those sources often have uh, an interest uh, in promoting that program, whether it's ethanol or the governor's Q, Q comp program or Job Z or all of these various programs that are in state government. And there's a lot of information about them. And frankly, sometimes legislators get a little confused about the conflicting messages about whether or not things are performing well or not. And so they will bring those issues to the Office of Legislative Auditor and ask us to do an evaluation. We get about 70 or 80 requests every year from legislators. We can only, with the staff we have, do about six or eight. And so we have a mechanism within the Legislative Audit Commission, which, by the way, is the group that appoints me for that six-year term. It's a bipartisan group of legislators, equal representation of House and Senate, of the minority and majority caucuses, and they appoint me, and they also choose these six or eight evaluation topics that we look at every year from all the ones that are suggested by their colleagues. And they have some criteria to work that number down to the ones that they finally select. Just to give you a, 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 a list of the ones we're working on now, for example, and it tells you another key thing about our office, and that is we get into virtually everything, um, which is often a challenge because a lot of the programs that we evaluate are quite complex. Uh, and we're getting into them, again, as a kind of an independent outside group, fresh. And so we have to take two or three people on our program evaluation staff and get them spending all of their time thinking, reading, talking, interviewing about nothing but that subject for the next six or eight months. So they can really deliver a report that is well informed, uh, give good background information, give uh, the legislature an idea of where some of the issues are that need attention. And so currently, uh, we are looking at conservation easements, a really growing area because of the legacy funds, but it, it predates that, but legacy funds are really uh, being used a lot to buy conservation easements to protect land without actually buying it because there's a lot of concern about the amount of land that the state owns 
and is taken off the tax roll. So one mechanism for doing some of the environmental and uh, habitat protection that we want to do, we do through in, uh, conservation easements. We're also looking at law enforcement's use of state databases. Some of you may have noticed that there's a lot of controversy around about uh, police officers accessing people's private data. And your driver's license, actually, if you didn't know this, that is a private piece of information that you're asked to show to everybody in the world. Uh, but a police officer is not supposed to go in and look at that without a business purpose. And in fact, it's been found that a number of officers have been looking at people's pictures. I don't understand that, but they have some attraction to looking at certain people's pictures. And it's become a real privacy concern, and so we're looking at that. We're also looking at the way the state uh, reimburses dentists for the services they provide under the Medicaid program. A very contentious, complicated area of state government. And I, I sometimes ask myself when we get the list, I mean, why, why are all of the ones we get kind of contentious and complicated? Aren't there any simple things for us to look at? And I guess not. But uh, there is a lot of concern among dentists about being uh, able to provide the kind of service that they are required to provide and being adequately remunerated by the state. Of course, there's enormous pressure to hold down costs for Medicaid, one of our fastest growing programs, both at the state and federal level. And we often put the squeeze on the vendors that provide the service through holding down reimbursements. We're looking at that. And we are looking at special education. I mentioned that as one of the issues. We are also uh, looking at uh, what is called state-operated human services. And that's a whole wide panoply of services that the state actually operates with state employees. Uh, it would surprise, I think, a lot of people to know that most of the medical and human services that the state obtains, we obtain through private sector vendors. But there are some human services that we provide through an actual state-operated facility. One of those, for example, is the state security hospital. And there have been a lot of issues about the operation of that, about the people that are civilly committed there, and so we're looking at that and a number of other of those uh, uh, facilities that the state operates. So that just gives you some sense of the breadth of what we get into. Uh, more recently, for example, we've also looked at uh, something that might be of interest to some of you, and that is governance of transit in the Twin Cities. Uh, and a report we issued, I think, two years ago with a lot of concern and is issues being raised about the governance structure at the Metropolitan Council and how it relates to local communities. So we do those evaluations. We publish the results in 80, 90 page reports with four page summaries so legislators can quickly get in. And we go over and present those results, highlighting some of the issues that we think need legislative attention. And frankly, I think over the years, uh, the legislature has been quite diligent in giving us uh, time and consideration, attention for those reports. But getting to results is not always easy because again, a lot of what we're looking at is complicated. There are a lot of constituencies that are impacted. Uh, one issue, for example, that we, um, looked at uh, two years ago, which is going to come back again, as you probably know from media reports, and that is civil commitment of sex offenders. And I use that as an example just because you can go out and get good information, accurate, objective information, and present it to legislators, and they can give due consideration to that. But they obviously work in an environment where their decisions have to be impacted and are they have to take into consideration a lot of different factors called politics. And I know that sometimes that is kind of a dirty word among people, but believe me, in my world and what I see among legislators, what that really means is they have to care about their constituents and the public, the values and interests that are out there. And so the facts alone, no matter how accurate, how objective, will not always give them the magic key that unlocks the doors to what we ought to do in special education or law enforcement use of databases or what to do with the growing number of civilly committed sex offenders that we are keeping uh, locked up. So 
that's kind of the world um, I work in, and I will end there because I really want to hear what interests you and uh, answer your questions. Do we typically create the policies for pilot projects with some sort of evaluation built into it that would be outside of your office? Great question. Um, you know, ideally it would be built in. And, and it wouldn't necessarily just be the legislative auditor doing it, but we often uh, say that uh, there is an evaluation and certainly a monitoring function that needs to go on at the department, at the program level. And if they uh, see that as the responsibility, they will start building into the development and design of that program the kinds of considerations of objectives, goals, and data systems that would allow them and the Office of Legislative Auditor to do that evaluation. That's, I think, one of the biggest challenges we often face when we go and evaluate a program. Uh, this probably won't surprise you, uh, that sometimes we're not real clear what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, there's a program in Minnesota, several hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, called Integration Revenue. It has a great purpose. Um, in many people's minds, and that is to do something uh, about uh, the challenges of disparity in educational performance, about creating a multicultural environment for kids. And so we give money to certain school districts to further that. And it's a very, very complicated allocation formula on who gets the money and how much they get. And so we did that evaluation, and what we found is, first of all, at a very general level, it sounds like a good program, but when you get it down to specifically what you're supposed to do with the money and what you're supposed to be accomplishing and how you're going to measure it, it was very, very unclear. And so one of the major recommendations we had, back to the legislature, is state more, much more clearly what it is you're trying to accomplish so that people out in school districts can set goals, set up monitoring systems to know when they're meeting that objective. Let me just mention quickly one other thing, which you may have noticed uh, last week we issued an investigative report on um, a program that the state was funding through giving money to a nonprofit private vendor. It was to reduce pregnancy in the African-American teen population. And uh, we found a lot of financial irregularity. But what I was particularly disturbed by was that there really had never been any follow-up by the Department of Health to determine if we were accomplishing anything. Now, in the way this individual was using the money for personal expenses rather than the purpose of the program, we couldn't have been. But they could have found that out either through better financial oversight or through more program monitoring. What are we accomplishing? How are we going to know whether we're being successful or not? Well, carrying on a little too long here, but it's a great question that ought to be built in on pilot projects, long-term programs, at the administrative level, as well as being done by auditors. You talked about uh, one of your audits is to look at some of the state operating services. Mm -hmm. Part of that going to be comparing costs of those state-run programs versus the private nonprofit sector? Yes, uh, definitely. Um, not only costs, but costs will be a factor. You know, again, uh, we do these programs because we're trying to accomplish something. So in addition to costs, we want to look at uh, what we're achieving as well. Without, and there's always risk that I'm going to ramble on here. So let me try to be really. Uh, okay. Um, again, I just want to emphasize how much state government operates in partnership with the private sector, both for profit. We, you know, we build roads not because we have a lot of state vehicles and people that go out and build roads. We, we hire that from contractors in the private sector. But as many of you undoubtedly know, we, uh, as I said, deliver a lot of human services uh, through vendors. We also buy medical services through uh, the private sector. And um, so in looking at state-operated services, 
One of the big questions is, could some of this be better accomplished through more uh, contracting and grant making uh, with nonprofit private organizations? Now, there, there's a big push, and there has been for a long time, and I think there's a lot of good in it, for privatization, for government not to try to do a lot, but uh, to partner uh, with the private sector, both profit and nonprofit. But I have to say, uh, and this is one of the messages that I preach constantly, and that is uh, we cannot just give the money over to a vendor and then walk away without an adequate amount of monitoring and accountability. And frankly, there is a whole set of skills that state employees or local employees need in knowing how to effectively manage that relationship from writing up the grant, writing up the contract, monitoring it properly without meddling, without being too bureaucratic, too much red tape. And we have a lot of examples of where we have failed, frankly, to do a good job. Um, more examples maybe of where we simply turned the money over, walked away, and said, okay, we're done. We gave the money, 300,000, 2 million, 10 million, whatever, to this vendor in the private sector, they'll get the job done. It's still public money, and there has to be some mechanisms of monitoring and accountability, and building those relationships is a very complex and challenging enterprise, and frankly, I think it's where uh, state government uh, falls down, and we need to do a better job. I just wanted to add one small piece to that that's really important that I think about. Um, with a lot of cuts that have occurred in government over and over and over and over and over, sometimes we go too far. I really worry about some of the state agencies and even local governments having the people to monitor the subrecipients of the money. It's a real factor, and so sometimes the state agencies aren't doing it. I bet you half the time or more it goes back to not even having the people to do the work. They're scrambling, just trying to get daily stuff done, which is not the way you would run your business. Um, it wouldn't, wasn't the way I ran my business. Um, you want to make sure that you're able to do a good job on the areas that are really, really important to your operation. So. On the teen pregnancy uh, pilot program or whatever term was used, I work at a software firm. We just completed this for the state of Alabama. And what it does is it's county specific and it overlays with spending and overlays that with objectives and outcomes. So you see it visually and it's color coded. And the idea is if you're spending a lot of money in this county with no results and very little money in this county with great results, maybe those two should talk to each other. That's the lesson. Would you call the commissioner of health and <laughs> partner with him to get that done? In I will so. care, I will call everyone uh, for what it's worth the TAP website, which probably no one logs on to, uh, Transparency and Accountability Project. Uh, that was written into law. It was to be created by the Department of Admin. I spent 18 months chasing it, and then MNB created it. I know the nature of government, but in the business world, it shouldn't operate that way. So setting that aside, here's my question. Uh, they were kind enough, MNB gave me a grid. No, actually, revenue did. I talked to so many different ones. Uh, so I have this Excel grid of 2,000 tax jurisdictions. It's something like 1847, something like that. And my question is, how many of those are audited and who does it? And the ones that aren't, why aren't they? I think that comes to me. So these are local entities? Yeah. Okay. So like, yeah. The classic is the Apple Valley Transit Tax mm -hmm. District, which mm -hmm. as you park and drive through it, you don't even know you're in it. Right. Minnesota has a form of water. Take your exactly. Those are called special districts in Minnesota. And we have quite a few of them. And what they are is they're, they deliver a service, a specific service, that doesn't necessarily stay within normal jurisdictional boundaries. So it could spill over between cities and counties, whatever else. And so we have many of them. And they can be around water, soil, um, um, hospitals, airports. And um, normally, yes, they have audit requirements. You have the teeny tiny ones that will fall outside of that, but they get audited. My office actually issues an annual financial report on special districts in Minnesota. All that data is available on my website. 
Um, the only problem with the special districts in Minnesota is that statute wasn't very clear on the audit requirements, and so my office got some legislation through early on that made it very clear <laughs> what the audit requirements were and the reporting requirements. So my office, in terms of the list we have of those entities, may not be totally complete because it's voluntary reporting. Now, if we find more, we contact them and say, you're required to report, and you know, then we report out the information. Um, and, and so anyway, that's a great, great question. Um, but we provide that accountability what's and transparency. The, hmm? What's the threshold and what makes it voluntary? Oh. Since tax dollars um, are tax dollars. Exactly, right. I can't tell you off the top of my head because towns have different ones than cities have different ones than... I'd suggest a dollar <laughs> would be the threshold. A dollar, yes. And the thing is, is um, um, on the special districts, for all local governments, um, that it is tax money and there has to be accountability and transparency for those over 3,300 units, which includes those special districts. Um, that's what my office's function is, is to make sure we know who they are, what they're spending, you know, what kind of revenue they're taking in. And um, you know what's unfortunate about that report? The media almost never covers it. And that's hard. And, and the Met Council falls into that report. Um, there's um, some larger entities that fall into that. Hennepin County Medical Center is one of them as well. Um, but the media doesn't cover it a lot, and I don't know if it's a confusing topic for them. I know when people figure it all out, they have great interest. The legislature actually recently, I think in the last year or two, wanted to know how many taxing entities do we have out there at the local level. And that's, these special districts are they're of interest. It's just hard to get, I'll continue to try to educate folks about them. But it's a great question. Did I get your, did I answer it for you? Start. And you can take a peek at the report. It's, I think it's good. So, <laughs> I just want to, uh, before we get to the next question, I just wanted to add a couple of points. Um, as I think about government um, and kind of what, what, what are the driving forces that um, are powerful in government that may not be as powerful in the private sector, I mean, one of the things we don't have that's very powerful in the private sector is the marketplace. Uh, we, we simulate that in various ways, but, but never will really accomplish uh, the force of the marketplace to uh, encourage good performance. But the other thing that complicates the world of government, and, and it's so ubiquitous that I think we sometimes fail to think about it, and that is the power of the boundary. That we draw so many boundaries that define who's responsible for what, who can tax what, and, and, they, and, they, all, and they do, there are many of them. Uh, they seem to multiply, particularly for the special district taxing authorities. And all of this uh, brought that topic uh, to be on our evaluation agenda uh, a year ago. Again, the state auditor has jurisdiction to do all of the audit work at the local level, but legislators ask us to kind of step back and look at local government from the possibility that we could maybe do a better job of encouraging, if not forcing, uh, consolidation. And just within the Twin Cities, I'm sure you all know that if you drive very far, you go through multiple jurisdictions. Um, and do we need all of those separate entities carved out with their separate city councils, mayors, staff, buildings, and all that sort of thing. So we issued a report that you might be interested in that kind of gives some information, background information, on um, local units of government and the possibilities of having fewer of them. I think my last count was there are like 27, uh, 2,700 different local jurisdictions, not counting uh, special taxing authorities. So there are a lot of them. Now, it gets to be a very sensitive issue, though, with probably even with you, if, for example, Roseville and St. Paul all of a sudden wanted to consolidate. Or if you lived in Lauderdale, really, really, really tiny little town. But talk to the people in Lauderdale if they want to become a part of Falcon Heights and Roseville or Minneapolis or <laughs> no, they don't. <coughs> because there are certain characteristics that they control by having their own little city that they want to keep. And so it is a very, very tough thing. One of the first assignments I had when I went to work for the legislature back in 1971 
was see if you can figure out any ways we could encourage our 87 counties to consolidate or just share human service offices. That's still a topic that's being talked about a lot. So it is one of those pieces of government that I think does sometimes inhibit us. It makes it much more complicated to function, but it's just one of those realities that's very, very difficult to change. There's a lot of um, collaboration that occurs where they do share, seven, eight counties will do one service together. So you can reduce your administrative burden, uh, but you're still getting the service out there. And it's happening all over. There was one that was trying to be done in southeastern Minnesota that has hit maybe one too many speed bumps, but it's been done for many years around the state. Another thing that I want to give some comfort to you, some of the special districts, my office gets calls from the public saying, this, these folks tax me and they're doing this or they're not doing this. We actually do special trainings with some of them because um, we were getting way too many calls. And so we always tell them be as transparent as possible understand how to manage your resources and be, you know, really good stewards of those tax dollars. And um, we've actually been able to have the call volume go way down because these folks do a better job. So we will target groups and um, types of entities to, to better serve the public. So. What kind of lessons have you um, learned in your work uh, that might be useful for folks in the business community? Can, I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm going to start and then you can finish. Um, what's really interesting is when bad things happen and happen in the private sector, you know, you'll get standards changed and, you know, banks have so many tough audit requirements that some of them say we can hardly stay in business because of these audits and Sarbanes-Oxley and everything else. That stuff comes back at government too, just so you know. <laughs> um, and government auditing standards constantly change and the accounting and reporting standards for government um, there's a board called GASB that sets the auditing and reporting standards for government. They are constantly putting out new statements and it's trying to make sure the government is transparent and accountable to the public. And if they think that something isn't being well rep represented, like they've done a big couple of big statements on pensions, public pensions, they don't believe that there's enough transparency. Government and pension plans are going to be reporting their numbers differently on the face of their financial statements in a different way than they ever have. It used to be in the notes. Um, so I would say that the private sector as well as government, we all want to do a really excellent job, whether you have shareholders um, or you're government and you have taxpayers. Um, government tends to get held, and don't take this in the wrong way, we get held to a much higher standard because our money is not our money, it's the taxpayer's money. And so there are things we do that are sometimes redundant and more thorough, it's because it's government and we have to. Um, otherwise, the taxpayers, you know, they will revolt or they'll say, um, we don't trust our government. And that's not a very good situation, so we want to make sure it does a great job. But I would say that, you know, um, when bad things happen in the private sector, your standards change. Our standards eventually change, too. So I think the folks that are setting our standards and regulators and everyone else are always watching, you know, if there's something bad happening. Um, could it be happening in the private sector? Could it be happening in government? Does that make sense? Auditing alone. Um, it is not going to get us to where we need to be. It really has to be incorporated in, first of all, to management. Uh, there's a concept in auditing called tone at the top that we believe really does set the tone for whether accountability, ethics, those kinds of things really fil filter down into an organization. If people in an organization see people at the top uh, not respecting um, ethics or the law, uh, it does set a bad tone, and organizations can go quite sour when that occurs. And I think one of the issues that we've been dealing with as a nation uh, in the private sector is what has been the tone at the top, particularly among some financial institutions. But, but it's a concept that I think applies at the uh, governmental level as well in management and in leadership. And that's why um, we strongly encourage, uh, for example, that uh, commissioners uh, and leaders in state government have some mechanism of internal auditing, as you <coughs> mentioned. In fact, um, one of the good things the current commissioner of health did when he became commissioner was he set up within his organization, uh, first time that I'm aware of, an internal audit function. Now, unfortunately, he came over to my office and stole <laughs> one of our audit managers 
but I was happy to see her go over there, and we do have a lot of our staff that go into internal audit operations around state government and elsewhere as well. And guess how we found uh, the impropriety and inappropriate use uh, of the grant money, over $350,000 of grant money over several years? It was by that internal auditor that the commissioner brought into his organization. She started looking at some of the documents that were coming in that were asking reimbursement for some of the supposed expenses. Didn't look right. So she called up her colleagues in the Office of Legislative Auditor and said, I think we need to investigate this. So again, there is a role and an important role for people on the outside doing independent work like Rebecca and I do and CPA firms. But, but if people think that is enough, I think they're making a sad mistake. I think to really get where we want to be in terms of ethics in the private sector, performance and accountability in the public sector, it really does have to start at the top. You know, you select six to eight projects each year. And having served in administration, I can tell you that when Jim announces the projects, there's this immediately, this hue and cry of, well, you deliberately chose the ones that will embarrass this party or attack this party. Jim, can you respond to that a little bit? And, you know, you mentioned you're part of a bipartisan group, but how do you ultimately deal with that political pressure inside your own office? Good question. Um, well, we start in terms of the selection process by having this bipartisan commission, which I think does help. And even the selection subcommittee is always bipartisan. Now, do some people, though, look at some of the topics that are selected as maybe having a, a little bit of a, a partisan edge? Yeah, they do. And uh, so when the governor's uh, programs are selected, by the Legislative Audit Commission, uh, people think, hmm, going after the governor. And frankly, I do think that for a period of time, uh, some governors think that the legislative auditor is after them. But, um, uh, you know, I think the proof, uh, at least in terms of uh, what is produced, is in the report. Yes, there may actually have been some partisan motivation on the part of some legislators to choose uh, a topic. I know, for example, over the years, we always had Republicans wanting to pick the programs on the Iron Range, you know, the kind of job type programs. And then they'd turn around and say, well, let's go after Job Z then. Or, so there can be that kind of, of effort, although I must say we have luckily had members of the Legislative Audit Commission over the years that have really tried to tamp that down. And if there is a particularly partisan legislator that wants to, to bring issues that really are just out of a partisan motivation, they try to remind them that this function is really a, a nonpartisan professional office. Where I also have frankly faced a challenge is when I'm asked to do an investigation. That too can raise an issue, and I really, as legislative auditor, have the authority to launch an investigation unilaterally. And I can either do that because of things I see that I think need to be investigated, or things that are brought to me as a request. Early in the Palenti administration, there were a lot of allegations about um, a settlement that was made by the Commissioner of Commerce with a banking uh, and insurance company in Florida the Attorney General, Mike Hatch, raised a lot of uh, very partisan uh, issues about that settlement. Got kicked around for quite a while and finally people came to me uh, and said, you really need to investigate this so we can have an independent, outside, nonpartisan look. But the environment had become so partisan that I really feared that it would appear that now I was going to be used by the DFL to go after Governor Plenty. So, I sat there and thought for a while and said, um, this is something that does need to be investigated. I think the governor and the public deserve uh, an independent, nonpartisan examination, an in-depth examination of these issues. They are quite serious. By the way, the allegation was that the settlement came in return for a campaign contribution to the governor from the insurance company. That was the allegation. So I sat down and wrote myself a letter and said, Dear Mr. Nobles, would you investigate this? And then I put a bunch of names at the bottom. 
I put the majority leader in the Senate, the minority leader in the Senate, the majority leader in the House, and the minority leader. And then I put the governor and the attorney general, and I walked the letter around and said, you want an investigation, sign this letter. And they all did. And we did the investigation, and I think people then could not perceive that it was motivated just by politics, and certainly uh, in the final result they couldn't either. So it is a very political world that we work in, and yet our function uh, is one that is supposed to be nonpartisan, professional. And we both, you know, have our challenges in maintaining that. I certainly have that challenge because I'm appointed by the legislature, uh, although for a six-year term, which helps, I cannot be removed <laughs> during that six-year term. Um, but I work in a very partisan environment, a lot of pressures there, a lot of people coming at me with a lot of issues to deal with. Rebecca, as an elected official, always, and not just Rebecca, but anybody who's ever been elected state auditor, it, it's always an easy allegation, oh, you did this audit out of some political motivation. I think we both learn, as have other auditors, you know, all you can really do to blunt that criticism is do good, professional, nonpartisan work. And you talk about some consolidations of some different governments, but other than that, other, other innovations that you've seen through this work that you care to share? Can, I'll, you know, um, I think for cities it's been survival. You know, some of our local governments, they've deferred capital outlay expenditures. They're not buying their squad cars. They're not always fixing infrastructure. But, you know, it, they're, they're getting back on a better footing. It's coming. So, um, but I would say that the performance measurement system is really, to me, a really great thing that's happening through that council and local results and innovation. And we had better participation in 2011. It dropped off a little in 12. And I'm on the council. Our job now is to review the measures we put out, review the system, see how it's working, and if we can get a lot more participation. Because anytime you're measuring performance, you guys do that in business, right? When I was in business, I used to do these big graphs and charts to chart our progress over time. And if there was a downturn, how that impacted our bottom line, what else could we do? So it's government tracking. As Jim said, you don't always measure. Well, they, they should measure. And then they should have that informed conversation with the taxpayers, because to me, it's easy to say rhetoric and it's easy to rip down government. To me, it's harder to um, do your work, measure your performance, and if you've been cutting and cutting and cutting and your um, fire response time is not acceptable anymore and you've lost a certain number of lives in that or property, you know, a business, whatever else, you can have that informed conversation again. You know, are we doing the right thing? Should we, with your taxpayers, should we be increasing revenues a little bit because we feel that fire response time needs to be improved? And have you done all you can to make sure that you're, um, when you respond, that it's, that it's real? Because I know some communities have looked at that. They analyzed how many calls they had and how many were actual real events. And a lot of them weren't. And they were trying to figure out how to improve on that. So these are all things. So to me, that those performance measures in the system are critical. And I want to continue to promote that. And our group, we have this fantastic group of city, county people. There's someone from Target Corporation on the council. Um, and we're reviewing the whole system. And we really want to work to promote this in government. I think it's a good thing. You know, we, we just went through a, a two-year period in the legislature where reform uh, was a, a very uh, frequently used word. Uh, people came into the legislature, it was a change in the leadership in the majority party, and I think there was a very strong feeling that uh, the folks that were elected had a mandate to produce reform, and I think that's great, I'm sure all of you do too. But I think what I've observed over the years is that reform takes a lot of work, takes a lot of effort, and you often have to kind of build an infrastructure that supports it. And you have to sometimes change management's approach to things and relationships with employees. You have to maybe um, create uh, some data and systems that might even cost you some money and you might have to really think through in a really hard way what are we trying to accomplish and how are we going to measure that and what kind of instruments are we going to use and what I have found is that um, sometimes there's a wave 
that comes in at the legislature of new people who have sort of some, some things that they've gone out and campaigned for that are called a reform. And, and they may even get them enacted. But, and I don't mean to be too critical here, they think then they've really accomplished something. I will even point to an example that we experienced this last uh, two years at the legislature. We created something called the Sunset Advisory Commission. The idea has been around quite a while that uh, you would uh, put a termination date on every organization in state government, bring it up for review, and it would have to sort of the people there prove that they are doing their work and accomplishing what needs to be done and that uh, spending money wisely. Well, first thing is there are a lot of programs, a lot of agencies that you have on your agenda and just working through them, uh, just quantitatively working through one at a time is a lot of work. And then some of those programs um, have very complex programs. So, you know, look at the Department of Human Services or Transportation or Health. You're dealing with many different programs. And then you're dealing with constituencies and interests that support and want those programs. I, I know this last round on Sunset, for example, looked mostly at some of the occupational licensing organizations that we have with the idea that we have a lot of them and maybe we could do away with some of them. But after a certain amount of effort on the part of the Sunset Commission, we got to just one really, that they could find that they wanted to sunset and do away with. And that was the Combative Sports Commission, which had one employee. And then after the interest groups kind of rolled out and said, no, no, we've got to have regulation for combative sports. It's violent. We need to regulate it as a state. You know, there's literally blood on the floor after those guys are done. But they needed, I think, because of some political pressure to say the Sunset Commission worked and they did, got rid of something. But then they had to go on the search to find where could they put it in some other department that it could be not counted as a separate standalone regulatory commission, but that it would just be a part of where. And literally it was weeks of searching around and not finding anybody who really wanted to be the home for the Combative Sports Commission. They went to the Department of Health and they said, no way, you know, that's everything we are against. <laughs> Folks at public safety, nope, they didn't want it either. So uh, anyway, um, point is, sometimes reform is hard. And, and so when you talk to public officials, legislators and others who have a reform agenda, uh, watch and see and make sure that they stick with it over a period of time because it isn't done easily.